So when you look at the sky uh, and you look at stars, you often see sort of what we call constellations. Now constellations are sort of a made up thing. I mean, these are things that, I mean, it's, let's say we could call it an arbitrary group of stars um, that appear close together, that appear close together but aren't necessarily. So in other words, they are not necessarily actually close to each other. What I mean by that, I mean this is arbitrary group of stars, they appear close together. Uh, they're not necessarily actually close to each other. So we might see a pattern in the sky. So this constellation, I think I showed this to you before, this is one at least seen in the northern hemisphere called um, Orion. This is supposed to be the hunter. This is supposed to be a dude here, and this here is supposed to be his belt, and these are his uh, legs, and this here is supposed to be his sword, although ha ha ha, a lot of people say it's not a sword, it's something else. In any case, and if you really use your imagination, you're supposed to see his bow here, and he's supposed to be shooting stuff. And over here, he's got a, this is supposed to be part of a dog. This is actually the star Sirius. Um, this is one of the brightest stars in the sky, uh, brightest things even. But uh, this one here is actually part of uh, a constellation called the Great Dog. And over here on this corner, there's actually a constellation called the Small Dog. And there's all sorts of different shapes that we sort of see in the sky and invent stories about. Um, but now, they don't actually need to be close to each other. In other words, this star right here might be very different distance than that one. They just sort of, they appear fairly bright, and they appear somewhat, you know, they appear to make a pattern in the sky. So they might appear close together, or they might appear, you know, that they're actually uh, making a pattern in the sky, but they're not necessarily actually close to each other. In other words, this one might be really close, maybe another one's really far away, but just really bright. So it's hard to tell really what's what. So constellations are sort of just a made up thing. And what I like about constellations, uh, you know when I talked about this, uh, there's uh, Canis Minor. It turns out, no kidding, it's a constellation of just two stars. So imagine, imagine a star, one star and another star, and no kidding, they say, that's a dog. That is a real constellation. It's called Canis Minor, for example. Take a look at it uh, if you want to look it up. But Canis Minor is actually, uh, I mean, it's actually pretty funny. I mean, laugh out loud. It's, it's just a constellation with two stars, and that's supposed to be a dog. I mean, to me, it looks like a stick, or, I mean, it could be anything. So actually, I found a couple little jokes here that talk about that. So they say, connect the dots for astronomers. So let's say you have, like, four dots. Then, hmm, a man on a horse with a spear. This is my favorite one here. These stars over here form the constellation Crusades. <laughs> it's like all this crazy stuff here happening just from two stars. So obviously a constellation is sort of a made-up thing, whereas a stellar cluster, that is something real. That is a group of stars that are actually, oops, a group of stars that are actually, actually, I can't seem to spell today, there we go, actually gravitationally bound to each other. In other words, these are really together, so gravitationally bound together. In other words, they really are close to each other. So this is an example of some globular clusters, as we call them. They can be open clusters and things like that. So these are groups of lots and lots of stars. It could be thousands and thousands of stars that are actually all close to each other. So we can, uh, I think it is, if I click here, I think it's going to open up a web browser here. Yeah, there we go. So we can see this is a web page here where the guy looked at a whole bunch of different globular clusters and where they are. There's a big list of them. And he sort of mapped them and where they looked. So if this here is our sun and this is our Milky Way, he sort of mapped where these different clusters are found. So they are found sort of different distances away. So just to sort of show that these are actual groups of stars. So these are these are really gravitationally bound to each other. So there is a difference between a constellation and a, gra and a stellar cluster. Constellation is just an arbitrary group of stars, right? We just decided that they were sort of made up a group. 
but they don't necessarily have to be close to each other. Whereas a stellar cluster, those are actually gravitationally bound. In other words, they are close to each other. Well, now I think it's time to do some uh, other pretty pictures. So let's look at what a nebula is. So a nebula, that, um, we could say it's just, how could we say it? Uh, it's just a, just a cloud of gas. And it's mainly, mainly just hydrogen gas. It's almost always mostly hydrogen. So it's just a cloud of gas. And nebula actually comes from the word for cloud. So it turns out this is sort of some cloudy looking thing. Now nebula can mean lots of different things. So it turns out this is one called the Dumbbell Nebula. And I'm pretty proud of this because I actually took this picture. Um, I had one of my courses where we went and hung out on a telescope in the Canary Islands, which may sound like a lot of fun, but we weren't on a beach at all. We were actually up on the telescope every night and sleeping during the day. But uh, this is one of the pictures we took of what's called the Dumbbell Nebula. And this is called a planetary nebula, which sounds a bit weird, but basically this is, there's actually a dying star in the middle and it's sort of pushing off, you know, gas, so it's layers of sort of gas clouds here. And so if you look really, really carefully, you see some different sort of layers here. So um, what we did here, we took a bunch of different uh, filters, so we took reds and greens and blues, and we put them together uh, to make it look as close to what it would actually look like if you could be close enough to it to take a picture. You know, without using a fancy telescope, it would probably look very close to something like this. This is called the Dumbbell Nebula, but just because it looks like gas, so what happens is hydrogen gas, if it gets excited, it gives off light, and that light then gets to us. Now this is another picture that I took. Um, it's called the Eagle Nebula. It's a really pretty one here. Now, I, uh, my group here, what we did is we tried to um, simulate a picture or tried to recreate a picture that the Hubble Space Telescope took. So that was a really fancy telescope. So here is our try at a picture of the Eagle Nebula. Uh, these blue stars are all stars in the foreground, so try to ignore those and just look at these cool clouds. Uh, so again, that's just sort of cloudy stuff. But what's really cool, take a look at the awesomeness of this picture. That's the same little region. If you go back, that's the same little region here, these three sort of pillars here. This is what the Hubble Space Telescope took. So that's an awesome version of the exact same thing we tried to take a picture of. And remember, ignore this. It's just a star in the foreground. You can see that same star over here. So over here, the Hubble Space Telescope took a much better version of it. And actually, this has been nicknamed the Pillars of Creation. Because what's happening is there's hydrogen gas, and it's being squished. So it's being compressed. And where it's being compressed, that's where there's these sort of areas here. And here's where the gas is sort of being burned away. So this is where the gas is being sort of squished here. That's because some, there's a big, big bright star over here that's sort of pushing and sort of squishing all the gas. Of course, when the gas gets squished, it might get hot enough and dense enough to start fusion. In other words, start lighting and making new stars. So some of these little pieces here, some of these little features, are very likely brand new stars. So that's why it's called the pillars of creation, because it's a, you know, these, in these pillars, especially at the tops, are where there's new stars being born. I think it looks beautiful. Here's another picture of a nebula. It's called the Butterfly Nebula. And again, these are just clouds of gas in the sky, in, the, in space. I think they look beautiful. Here's another one called the Crab Nebula. I don't really see a crab here, though, but uh, this is a cool picture. And this is actually a neat one because this is a remnant of a supernova that was seen a thousand years ago. So actually, it turns out the Chinese saw a big, bright thing in the sky. I think it was in 1053, if I remember correctly. Um, 1051, maybe. But it, it was, uh, they saw it in the 1050s. And what happened was they saw a big, big, bright object in the sky. And they were very good at writing down where things were and when they were. And it turns out now, when we look in the same area, we see this. And we think that's because they saw a supernova, and this is the remnant of a big supernova explosion. So this is the gases that have been sort of spread out. So imagine a little star in the middle here blew up and sent out lots of stuff out. Well, if that stuff sort of, you know, that could have been gases and things that get hot, and so they give off light in different colors. It looks really cool. So those are what nebulas are. And last but not least are shooting stars. Now... When we say a shooting star, I mean, some people see that in the sky. They see a little thing go like, pew, across the sky, and they think, ooh, it's a shooting star. 
And I think the real thing behind, the real story behind shooting stars is way more interesting than just a star moving, because it's not a star moving. We actually have different definitions. So a meteoroid, that's actually something that, um, that's something that is in our solar system. It's sort of some sort of sand uh, up to boulder size. So some sort of sand to boulder sized piece. And it's in our solar system. So that means basically in our you know, around the sun, orbiting around the sun, there's lots of dust and little pieces of rocks and things. So it's between sand-sized and boulder-sized pieces. So it could be lots of different things. But that's what we call a meteoroid. Now, a meteor is actually the name given to you know when it is in our atmosphere. So what I mean by that is what if... You know, if, if we have, let's say this is the sun. I'll draw like this right here. And let's say we have the Earth over here. And the Earth goes sort of in this kind of orbit like this. Like that, that's the Earth. Now what if, I mean, there's lots of different dust pieces. So imagine there's some little bits of dust all over the place. What if there's a piece right here? If it's just a little piece of rock or a little grain of sand or something like that. As we go through our orbit, what if we sort of run into it? Well, that little piece of sand, when it's in the solar system, it's called a meteoroid. When it's in our atmosphere, it actually heats up. So it heats up and it glows. So that is actually what the shooting star is. So if you see a shooting star, what you're really seeing, I think it's really cool, you're actually seeing a little piece of sand or a little piece of rock or up to, you know, boulder size. You're seeing a little thing that's actually entering our atmosphere. Now, our atmosphere is actually, uh, I mean, there's lots of air and other gases, but and you might think that it's very smooth and easy to get through, but if you're a little piece of rock that's sort of staying pretty still and we're just sort of flying through, it's going to get very hot. It's like if you rub your hands together really fast and press really hard, your hands are going to get hot, right, because of friction. Well, it turns out when this piece of dust enters our atmosphere, there's an immense amount of friction. So when you see a shooting star, what you're really seeing is usually just a little piece of sand. And seriously, it's the size of a grain of sand on average. And it's just heating up and glowing. So that's what you're seeing. Now, of course, we might have what we call a meteorite. That's if it lands on the ground. So sometimes, if it's big enough, we might actually find a piece of it on the ground. Now, what's really amazing, I think, is this. That, um, I mean, this always blew me away knowing this. There's about 15,000 tons um, of dust each year that enter our atmosphere from space. So this is what we could call sort of cosmic dust. So uh, what could leave this stuff? Well, it could be a lot of things. I mean, what if, for example, a comet goes around? We talked about comets before. What if you have a comet that has a really sort of, what if it has like a pass like this, like a comet came by? Now, when the comet came by, of course, it's got lots of dust and rocks and things like that and ice. So, of course, when it comes near the sun, you know, uh, the ice sort of melts and maybe some little pieces of dust sort of get left. So let's say there's some pieces of dust that get left over over here and over here. And what if we happen to cross its path? Well, then we can predict, oh, we're going to have a whole bunch of extra dusty pieces, right? When we cross here, we're going to have a lot more pieces. So if things like this happen, or other areas where we know there's lots of pieces of dust, we can predict that we're going to see lots of meteors. So we call that a meteor shower. So if you ever hear in the news, oh, look, there's a meteor shower. What does that mean? It means that we know that in our path around the sun, we're about to cross through an area where there's lots of junk in the way. And so we're going to have a lot of that junk enter our atmosphere. And it makes very, very pretty things. So um, if I can get this to work, I have a little YouTube video here that I'd like to show you. I hope it works. This is actually, uh, this is a big meteor that someone actually took a video of. So take a look. Happened in Mexico in 2006. Pardon the ads, but take a look. This is in the sky. This is something, this is a big one that I actually went through. So this is not just a piece of sand. That's probably a big, big chunk that was heating up. 
And so sometimes people actually go hunting for these meteorites on the ground. And what's really cool is that some of these meteorites, we can actually tell, believe it or not, where they came from. And so some of them have come from, you know, some of them are really simple things from when the solar system was first made. Some of them are sort of, for example, called like uh, carbonaceous chondrites. So those are really dark, very, very black, and they seem to be made of the same stuff that like the very primitive things in the solar system were made from. But some of the things that have landed on the ground uh, here on Earth, we actually know that they came from somewhere else. And that is what sounds mind-blowing. So, for example, there's a few meteorites that are thought to come from Mars. And you might wonder, how in the world did a piece of rock come from Mars, and how can we tell that it did? Well, uh, geology is the complicated way to say how can we tell that it did. But we have actually a mechanism that we know of that could easily um, cause pieces to come up. What if, for example, you're on Mars and Mars gets hit by a big giant thing? Let's say some big giant thing hits Mars and it creates a big explosion and lots of pieces come out. So those pieces might actually leave Mars's orbit and just end up just going around the Sun. And eventually then they might actually get close enough to the Earth to where we run into it. And it's actually thought that that's the mechanism by which we can actually find meteorites that came from Mars. There was a really famous one where they thought that they saw some uh, fossils in there, or at least signs of organic life. So some scientists were convinced that that showed that Mars used to have life, whereas other scientists said, no, there's other natural uh, causes that could have caused these shapes in the rock. And the problem is the jury's sort of still out. I think it depends on which scientist you ask and which of them sort of looked at the data which way. So it's difficult to know from that one meteorite uh, what happened. But I think it's really cool that when we get these big meteorites hitting us, these are things from outer space that are landing. And they might be simple pieces of dust, they might be bigger chunks of rock, they might be pieces from other planets, they might be bits from comets or bits from asteroids. But when we see a shooting star, what you're seeing is you're seeing a piece of junk basically coming into our atmosphere. Heats up and glows.